you may be seated. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Last Sunday marked 37 years from the time that I gave my life to the Lord and began serving the Lord. 37 years, not just of attending church, I had grown up in church, but 37 years of actively preaching, teaching, witnessing, studying, and serving the Lord. Those who knew me, actually the only person here who's known me the whole 37 is my mom. She can testify. My wife has known me for 31 of those. Soon we will be having our 31st anniversary. And so she can testify to 31 of those years. We hit the ground running. We got married and we hit the ground running in ministry and we've been working ever since in ministry. But um, you'd think someone would learn something in 37 years. There's a lot of people that uh, have only been a Christian five or six years and they think they've got it all figured out. I probably thought I had it all figured out in five or six years being a Christian as well. Uh, you check out most of our critics and find out how long they've actually been studying and reading and learning and you'll find that they're probably in that stage. It's like the teenage years of being a Christian when you think you know it all and then you move on beyond and you realize you didn't really know much at all and then you actually start learning and growing and hopefully after 37 years you learn something. In James 5, 7, just stay there in Matthew 5. In James 5, 7, it says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. In Judea, they had rains in November when they were planting the wheat. And then they had, in late April, they had the spring rains right before the harvest of the wheat that helped the ears to fill. Uh, waiting for the precious fruit of the earth means that there was a plan. There was a, a preparation, there was a sowing, there is a waiting, there is a cultivating, there is a plan for a harvest. I have found, after 37 years, that a lot of the theological hodgepodge is nothing but satanic distraction from the simple truth of Scripture. When I was a young man, first converted, I looked at the aged preachers with their mega churches, 7,000 seat auditoriums and their commentary sets and all this, the same way a young Israelite would look at the high priest and the Levites and the sons of Aaron and think, wow, they must really know God. They really know the Bible. Someday I'll know the Bible like they know the Bible. After 37 years, I look back and realize they don't know the Bible. They knew a creed taught to them in a Bible college. They knew a doctrinal position taught to them. They knew theological words and phrases taught to them from theology books. And now I go back after 37 years and I look at those theology books, which I still have my textbooks from Bible college. I went to Bible college in uh, 85 and 86 and on through, uh, went to... Uh, Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri and then being totally disgusted went back home, went to Howells Anderson College in Crown Point, Indiana and then after I was married I did correspondence courses with Bethany and Trinity two different Bible colleges one in uh, Alabama Dauphin, Alabama and the other one in Indiana I'm trying to think of what the city was anyways, uh, Newburgh I believe Anyways, looking back, I'm appalled at the confusion and the distraction, the muddying of the waters, the lack of simple obedience. John the Baptist said, 
of these this harvest the, the coming Lord will gather the wheat into his garner but the chaff he will burn with fire and quenchable Jesus said in Matthew 13 30 let both grow together the tares and the wheat until the harvest and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn the wheat the elect the bride the harvest it's all so plain so clear God is looking for a harvest God is looking for a certain type of people God is going to have his barn filled God is going to have the wedding filled God is going to have a bride he is going to have a harvest and the big question is will you be which harvest will you be in will you be his harvest or will you be the chaff harvest will you be the wheat harvest or will you be the tear harvest and then you don't need a lot of theology to figure this out it's basic it's all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in Revelation 14 14 and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped that's one harvest and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven he also having a sharp sickle and another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle saying thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth the vintage of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God two harvests basic simple if you turn to Matthew 5 where you're supposed to be waiting on me there you'll find what's called the Sermon on the Mount the confusion clouding this Sermon on the Mount is also quite amazing and astounding I've heard people say in the dispensational camp that well this is not for us Christians this will be the rule of, of his kingdom someday but we can't live up to this I've heard people try to say well this was Jesus coming and uh, and correcting on Mount Sinai he's correcting on, Mount, on the Sermon on the Mount so this is the new covenant that was the old covenant and and all kinds of foolish stupidity when you realize that Jesus is the Son of God he's the one who wrote uh, inspired what came down from Mount Sinai Jesus the I am was on Mount Sinai speaking from Mount Sinai and speaking to Moses it doesn't take a lot of theology to know that it takes a lot of theology to get around it right it takes a lot of theology to get around the obvious truth and it's amazing to me how people can stubbornly hold to ideas simply because they're wanting to avoid obvious truth mm -hmm. they're wanting to avoid the obvious so they 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 will go in search of commentaries in search of ideas in search of of concepts that seem to bolster their case against obvious truth you see it in not only in spiritual you see it in the political realms as well and it is amazing how people I mean if I had to fix my truck and there was a a standard accepted way to fix the radiator but I wanted to fix it another way and so I went searching all over the place to find evidence for another way to fix the radiator and and even though it obviously was not gonna work I wanted to do it that way so I kept pushing the issue you'd say you're a fool well when people do that in other areas of life it's the same thing you will find Jesus in these three chapters saying things that are very basic profundity in simplicity the art of being profound and yet very simple and understandable and so Jesus says words that are studied and meditated on for centuries this sermon there's nothing uh, you, you would think that the man 
who healed the blind, raised the dead, calmed the storms, He's going to speak. What's He going to say? He knows how to tell the, the storm to stop. He's in control of the sea. He can walk on water. He's going to open His mouth. He's going to teach. What's He going to say? Surely it'll be way over our heads. Surely it'll be something that we never even fathom. Surely it'll be hard. We'll have to sit and think a long time to figure it out. No. That would actually be a sign of lack on the part of the one speaking. But when he says life-changing things that are down on your level, it shows a wisdom and a power that is fitting for the Master. <clears throat> Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, He's not coming to correct God. He's not coming to correct God's prophets or God's law or God's scriptures. Now, any lame brain ought to be able to at least think that. And we're going to see that they would be easier to think it if they would listen to what He said. Because He said that very thing. Okay? But, we know from Genesis to Revelation that God is looking for a people. Do you know that nine times in the book of Deuteronomy it is commanded to love the Lord? Love the Lord. So basic. And yet loving the Lord is everything. Mm -hmm. If you don't love the Lord, you're, not, you're going to be the chaff. If you do love the Lord, you're going to be the wheat. Okay? Nine times in the book of Deuteronomy it says, Love the Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord. Nine times. Now, all the Jewish theologues, if they had just done that, they could throw their theology in the trash can and just love the Lord and they would have made it. What Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is describing the difference between those who love the Lord and those who love their creed, those who love their position, those who love their self, those who, who love uh, their own glory and eminence. The terms of the covenant that God gave Israel had been misrepresented by the caretakers. The gardeners had been busy trying to cultivate what they wanted rather than the harvest the Lord wanted. God wanted a people who loved Him, who loved His law, who loved righteousness. So, on the Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus doing? He's calling to that people. Let's, let's read here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay. We have here a description of a character. These aren't seven different types of people. This is a description of the elect. A description of God's child. A description of those who love the Lord. Okay? They're going to be humble in spirit. Poor in spirit. They're going to be uh, mourning. Because living on this earth and loving God is going to cause mourning. You're going to mourn over your sin. You're going to mourn over the sin around you. You're going to mourn over the fact that God is not honored the way He ought to be honored. You're going to mourn over the stubbornness of those who do not want to just love the Lord, but are fighting for something else. They're, they're, they're fighting for their own idea, their own creed. That person is going to be meek. That person, meekness means keeping rank. Okay, the meek are those who respect boundaries and keep rank. Those who love the Lord are going to do that. Those who love the Lord are going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those who love the Lord are going to be merciful like the Lord is. 
Those who love the Lord are going to be pure in heart. Pure in heart means my heart is right before God. My motives are pure. My desire, my purposes are pure. I'm not stubbornly fighting for something of my own doing. I, my heart is, is clean before the Lord. I'm open before God. And uh, it says they shall see God. Yes, they will. Peacemakers. Not pacifists, but peacemakers. Those who seek to establish peace by law and order. God doesn't establish peace through pacifism. He establishes peace through law and order and the establishment of righteousness, the upholding of truth, and the, the proper dealing with error, and seeking for what? Peace. Seeking for a, a, a appropriate peace. Peacemakers. Uh, persecuted for righteousness' sake. Cast out, reviled, not liked for the name of Jesus. Not because they're being uh, obnoxious, not because of their own personality, but because of their love of the Lord. Okay? So he just describes here, this is what God's looking for. Now, I can show you through all the Old Testament. That's what God was looking for. Okay? He was, he's always been looking for that. So, for Jesus to come down, the purpose of the new covenant that God announced through Jeremiah, hundreds of years before Jesus came, was to write His law in their hearts. Why don't you do a word search of the law in the heart in the Old Testament? Do a word search of loving the Lord with your heart. And putting this law in your heart. And having the circumcision of your heart. And not just your flesh. In other words, God says, I want you to not live according to a form. I want you to love truth. Love righteousness. Love the Lord. Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, okay... He's saying ye, he's talking to his disciples in the presence of a multitude. Obviously the savor is what we just looked at. The savor of that perfect character. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost this character, it's good for nothing but to, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. Okay, and so he says, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And then, right before he enters into a, uh, the antithesis of his teaching versus the teaching of the, the, the failing teaching of the Jews, uh, he makes an announcement, just so nobody gets confused. Okay? He didn't want anybody to get the wrong idea. He wanted to make sure you, he wanted to make it simple so people could understand. He says, don't think. That I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, obviously his life and teaching was seeking to fulfill the purpose of God's law. Matthew 7, 12, which is in a couple chapters here in the Sermon on the Mount. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Okay, so if you want to fulfill the law and the prophets, what do you need to do? You need to do unto others as you have them do unto you. And you have fulfilled the law and the prophets. It didn't mean abolish. It meant, he said, he meant fulfill. And he did fulfill it. Um, he explains, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, shall all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore, he's, he's making it even plainer, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the people listening to him were raised in Judaism. Every week, every Sabbath at the synagogue, the scriptures were read. Even during the week, they met and meditated in the scriptures. Okay, From a child up, they were taught the commandments. They were taught the scriptures. They wore garments that were meant to remind them of the commandments of God. And yet I have heard people say that, well, people sitting there, they didn't have a Bible in hand to cross-reference what Jesus was saying. They knew exactly what he was saying, and the master teacher was speaking on their level. 
Okay? He wasn't speaking over their heads to somebody out there in the tribulation period. No, he's speaking to the people sitting right in front of him. And they knew exactly what he said. He said here, what I'm going to say here in a minute, don't be confused. I'm not correcting or destroying or altering or interfering with the law of the prophets. I'm fulfilling it. I am telling you the proper view of it. He goes on to say, verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Alright? The idea here is this. Everything he's going to mention here is a teaching given by the scribes and Pharisees, but there's a flaw. There's a fatal flaw. The scribes and Pharisees, like we talked about in Sunday school, were looking for the boundary and just, as long as I don't go over that line, I'm okay. Oh, here's the boundary. If I go over this line, then I've sinned. But if I don't go over that line, I'm okay. A lot of Christians do that. Oh, I have liberty to... Oh, I, I think this is still lawful. Paul says, is, is it expedient? Is it appropriate? Is it a good testimony? Is it building? No, you're just fighting for it's lawful. So Jesus made it very plain before he went on that I am not speaking contrary to the law. I am actually speaking to forward the cause of the law, fulfill the purpose of the law. Ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Yeah, that's what you've heard. That religion alone is not enough. That application of the law is not enough. Oh, I haven't killed anybody. I'm okay. He says, no. It's not enough. That's not. Okay, God is love. God's law is love. If you obey God's law by saying, well, there's a line. I haven't gone over it. Do you love the Lord? You don't love the Lord. You love yourself. You love life. But if you say, thou shalt not kill, but I love the Lord, are you going you gonna to get right there by the line? No. If you love the Lord, you're going to love the character of the Lord. You're going to love the attitude of the Lord. You're going to have the attitude, the beatitudes over here. Those beatitudes are not just going to not kill. Okay? So Jesus says, in application of God's law, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Do you know that the revised version removes without a cause? But you'll notice it's not in italics. It's in the Greek. Okay? The Greek says without a cause. Or causeless. Or vainly. Or however you want to translate it. Basically, the translation is good. Who they, whosoever is angry with his brother causelessly, vainly angry, angry without a proper founding. Now you may think you have a cause, but the question is, does God think you have a cause? Okay, we're talking about God's law. So, if I am angry with my brother without a proper cause, am I loving the Lord? Oh, I didn't kill. Are you loving the Lord? Okay, killing is something that the civil authorities have to deal with. Yes, it's a sin. But the question is, are you the wheat or a tear? The question is, which harvest will you be in? The question is, are you the people that God is looking for? Jesus came to write God's law in the hearts. That's what God wants. So, yeah, you've heard, don't kill. But what about being angry with your brother when you really have no biblical cause? What's, what about that? Have you been taught about that by the Pharisees and Sadducees? No. Because they don't love the Lord. And they're not going to teach that which they practice. Teach against it. And who sure shall say to his brother also in the same context without a cause, Reka, uh, which basically is another term meaning the same thing as fool, uh, empty, shallow, shallow-brained, whatever. Uh, there's a number of different possibilities there. Shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Obviously, angry with your brother, abusive language towards your brother, a wrong attitude towards your brother, and you have no cause before God. God is it's not a righteous attitude. You say, well, can it be a righteous attitude? And you say thou fool. 
Jesus called people fool many times. Oh, fools and blind? Yeah, was that a righteous attitude? It most definitely was. Was it causeless? No. There was cause. Paul said, uh, call people fool. Because they were, they were indeed fools. And, and, and biblical name calling is, is biblical. But you better make sure that you're speaking in line with the Spirit of God. When Jesus said fools and blind, uh, vipers, uh, snakes, whatever he, whatever he used, brute beasts, clouds without wind, and, and, uh, or clouds without water, and so forth, foaming waves of the sea, all sorts of things people are called that are false prophets. Is that violating the scripture? Absolutely not. The scriptures don't violate the scriptures. Okay? The scriptures have a purpose that is consistent with all writers of scripture. So, uh, Jesus is saying, verse 23, If you bring your gift to the altar, and there remembers thy brother hast aught against thee. In other words, you are, you are trying to maintain your relationship with God and hoping he doesn't look at your relationship with man. You don't have a right relationship with your brother, and it's your fault, but you want to think you can still come before God and be all pious and holy. God says, leave your gift. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want your gift. Go get right with your fellow man. And so, obviously, the ought was your fault. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Okay, now, none of this is contrary to God's law, but God's law is a framework of principles that have to be applied. These are areas where they weren't getting applied properly. Okay? The, the New Testament is the same thing. A framework of principles. So when we get up here and teach and preach, we may talk about specifics. Your hair, your clothes, your music, your reading material. We may bring those up. You say, well, where's chapter and verse? No, there's principles and we are helping you apply it in your life. And if you are one of those who love the Lord, it will be a, no problem. If you're one of those who love the Lord and are hoping for the wheat harvest instead of the tare harvest, you won't have a problem with it. Okay? Jesus is helping them to apply the law where they had not applied it before. Where they were not properly applying it. Um, verse 25 this is also in, in, in the same we're, we're taking the character of God's people the beatitude man all right, and we're applying it in areas of life where the Jews were not being properly taught and we're failing to apply God's law agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Those who love God, and are peacemakers, and those who want things to be right and proper and just, will not stubbornly hold on to error until suddenly it's brought before the court, and they are condemned and sent to prison. They're going to want to settle out of court. They're going to want to make things right. You know, I've seen children argue, 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 and then one of them says, okay, let's go talk to mom and dad. Okay, okay, okay. Suddenly, when dad's going to get involved, you know that once it makes it to dad, once it's in dad's lap, somebody's going to be bending over the bed, right? Somebody's going to get it once it comes. To so let's settle, let's settle before it gets to dad. Make things right. Well, some people aren't that smart, and it goes all the way to dad. And dad sits down and gets all the evidence, and then they get it. And then they think, you know, I'd been smart not to be so stubborn. Um, but that's what Jesus is saying here. You're angry with your brother. Oh, so you think you have a cause. Are you going to hang on to that cause all the way to the judgment seat? Are you going to hang on to that cause until it gets in the judge's uh, realm? Once it gets there, you're in trouble. Settle it. Settle it out of court. Okay, these are just practical applications of the law. Nothing contrary to Moses. Where did I say unto thee, uh, verse 27, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Start 
So that, that's the epitome of righteousness. Don't commit adultery. He said no. People cannot. People can live in that realm and not love God. People can live in the realm of not kill and not love God. But those who love God, those who are the beatitude man, that's not enough. Okay? The beatitude man who loves the Lord is not going to ride on the, uh, the letter of the law. They're going to follow the spirit of the law. And they're not going to be lusting. They're not going to be looking improperly. They're not going to be committing adultery in their heart. Okay? They, like we spoke, they're going to try to do what is holy and right and pleasing to the Lord. They're going to live before the eyes of God. Not just maintain their their uh, um, membership in Judaism. Okay, I, I don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. You know, so I'm going to stay within this certain realm. Those who love God aren't content with that. Jesus is trying to draw out a people that he wants in heaven. The wheat harvest, as opposed to the tare harvest. So he talks about in this same commandment uh, verse 31 it has been said whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing to worship well that's, that's as far as the scribes and Pharisees went with it you ever put away your wife give her a writing to worship make sure, make sure you do the paperwork but lovers of God and lovers of truth the beatitude man is that okay for him just make sure I do the paperwork and it's all okay no no the lover of truth and the lover of God is going to make sure whenever there needs to be an application of Deuteronomy 24 that it's based upon the purposes that God gave in Deuteronomy 24. You see, God's law is God's remedy for man's problems. The law was made to remedy sin problems. Okay? That's why the Bible says the law does not lie against or was not made for the righteous man. They don't write these laws to regulate the righteous man because the righteous man, the love, the God lover, is not going to be doing these things. Okay? Um, so, these laws were written to remedy when sin happens. Now, Deuteronomy 24 was meant to be used by godly people for godly purposes. Deuteronomy 24 is not a loophole for carnal men. As people foolishly teach. Shame on them. They, let him let take that slander before the throne of God and explain to him how his law was a loophole for carnal men. Mm. I think he'll be offended at that, don't you? I think he'll say, Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? False piety always does that. Mm -hmm. No. God's law was God's all-encompassing wise solution for the problem of man's sin. And you don't get any smarter than God. You don't get any wiser than God. But it was meant to be used by God-loving people for God-loving purposes. And the God-loving people will only use it for that purpose. Because that's their heart. Now, so, whosoever puts his wife, puts away his wife, not for the cause of fornication, but for some frivolous, non-lawful cause, an abuse of the law, they need to stop and realize what they're creating is adultery though they are thinking that the paperwork absolves them of, of adultery it's actually creating an adulterous situation because if they're putting her away and God has not allowed it God has not put her away because it's not according to his law then her marrying another when she's not really free because it's not lawful is going to be an adulterous situation. And the guy that marries her is going to be drawn into an adulterous situation because it was not done according to God's law. And so Jesus is saying, yeah, you, you, you sit back there in your false piety and thinking, well, I'm not an adulterer. You know, give her a right. Make sure you get the paperwork in order. And Jesus says, no. No, you're misusing God's law. You actually are creating adultery even though you piously, falsely think you're not. Um, what Jesus is saying here and what the whole New Testament Old Testament speaks of is that religion that doesn't reach the heart doesn't change the heart doesn't flow from the heart is not worth the dirt that it would take to bury it God is not impressed He does not want it 
He does not want a religious Jew who's just living by the, the letter but has no love for the law, no love for God, no love for His ways. God, God does not want that. That's called chaff in God's book. So, then we go down. Again, you have heard been said by them of old time, verse 33, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform in the Lord thine oaths. Now, that was the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. While they swore by the heaven, by, their temp by the temple, by the altar, by the gift on the altar, by their head, by, by all kinds of things. While they violated the law of God, they false, in their false piety, they said, well, just don't perjure yourself. Make sure you perform it in the Lord your oaths. Jesus said, no. Don't swear at all in those realms. None of those, those man-made oaths are acceptable. The God, the, the only reason, the only reason for swearing by Jerusalem instead of calling God to witness is a selfish reason. The only reason that you're going to swear by the altar or you swear by my head or my hair or swear by something else instead of saying, I swear by Jehovah God, the only reason for doing that is a selfish reason. Mm -hmm. Because when you call God to record upon your soul and you swear lawfully, you are calling God to be a witness of your motives, your purposes, and your performance. And the reason you would avoid the name of Jehovah in your oath, in your vow, is because you're trying to get by with something wrong. Yep. It cometh of evil, just like Jesus said. So these are the attitudes. The beatitudes of people that God wants in His fellowship. And then there we have the illustration of the beatitudes. And right before the illustration of these beatitudes, Jesus clarified, don't think I'm teaching contrary to the law. Just because you haven't heard it applied in this way, don't think I'm speaking contrary to the law. I'm not. Whoso shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so. Did Jesus do that? Yes or no? No. He didn't do what He was condemning. Do you have to go to college to figure that out? That Jesus didn't do what He condemned. Is that pretty basic? <clears throat> okay, so we have Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not perjure yourself. And then we have the issue of an eye for an eye. You have heard it been said? An eye for an eye. Tooth for tooth. Okay, so because the law gave the magistrates a just principle to execute legal affairs in Israel. This was for the magistrates. It was for the judges. Okay? It was never meant for personal vengeance. Never meant for, you know, okay, you did this to me, I'm going to do this back to you. Never meant for that. It was meant for law and order. God's law is God's ways. God is wise. All wise. God is love. So these were principles of love. But when they're not used and not applied by God-loving people, they are misapplied. And so Jesus said, no, no. You're using this, right? That you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is talking about their use of it for personal vengeance. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Don't don't be so caught up in making sure it's fair to me and I'm avenged and I'm, I'm covered that you forget that you're supposed to be the Beatitude Man. You're supposed to be loving righteousness. If you were in love with God and His ways, it wouldn't all be about, well, what's fair for me? What's okay for me? What's right for me? You'd be concerned about representing Him. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. God-loving people always do that. Uh, you have heard it been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this is all within the realms of law and order. When the Philistines invaded the land, what were the civil authorities supposed to do? Let them invade the land? 
irregardless of the laws of Israel? No. That wasn't loving the enemies. The civil authorities were supposed to protect the people. They were supposed to love their people more than the enemies. All right? Our government is not obligated to love immigrants, illegal immigrants, more than their citizens. That's ridiculous. They're supposed to uphold law and order for the protection of the citizens. Illegal immigrants are illegal and they need to come through legal channels. All right? And if they were asylum seekers, they should be doing that in Mexico, the first country they come to. This, this, all, this is all a political thing going on, and, and trying to use verses from the Bible about not oppressing the stranger is totally inappropriate. It's not what the Bible is talking about. We should love those who are our personal enemies. Okay? And try to be a peacemaker. Try to have peaceful solutions. God-loving people do that. God-honoring people do that. But... God-loving authorities do not allow the Philistines to invade the land and harm the citizens. That's not God's way. It's, it's not appropriate. And all you do is read the Old Testament and see what God did. He raised up kings and helped them to drive out the Philistines. So, yeah, th there's, this is an application of God's love an application of God's law to life appropriately. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Okay? He wants us to be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So what does the Heavenly Father do? Okay? He loves all mankind. He has His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He tries to be benevolent to all. But He, obtain, he upholds law and order. He upholds law and order. He protects the innocent blood. He protects the widow against her oppressor. He avenges the fatherless and the widow. He sets up government to keep law and order and protect countries and citizens. That's the same father. All right. That same father made hell fire and will fill it with the rebels. So, yeah, we're supposed to be perfect even as our father which is in heaven is perfect. And so, what God wants, there is... There is a person that the husbandman is trying to fill his kingdom with. The Beatitudes are a description of this person's attitude. And these applications are trying to help the people who see this Beatitudes is right. He's trying to show them how they're misapplying God's law and how the Beatitude man, how he would do it. How God-loving people would do this and not how the scribes and Pharisees are doing it because most of them by this time were corrupt. They were watching out for their own position, their power, their creed, their ideas, and they weren't humble, God-loving people. And so Jesus came preaching what God-lovers do what righteous, God-fearing, God-loving people would do. Did they like it? No, they didn't like it. Because when you start isolating the Beatitude man, and you start talking about this is God's harvest, this is wheat, what you're doing is excluding everything else. You're excluding everything that is not the wheat. You're excluding everything that is not the harvest that he's looking for. So, when he says, but I say unto you, he's talking about loving righteousness versus serving your own standard. Fighting for your own way, your own idea, your own thought. Um, then he goes on in verse 6, take heed that you do not your own before men, to be seen of them. Should, is it somewhere in the law of God where it forbids you this motive? Well, there are principles, yes. But Jesus is applying the fact. The, the principle, nine times spoken of in Deuteronomy, to love the Lord, takes care of this. Takes care of all of these. If they would love the Lord, none of these would be issues. It's the fact that they want to be religious, they want privileges, they want benefits, but they don't really love the Lord. It's why Jesus is having to speak of these issues. These issues come from not loving the Lord. Alright? 
doing your alms before men to be seen of them. Praying on the corner of the street to be seen of men. Um, and <clears throat> laying up treasures on earth. Judging hypocritically. <clears throat> All of these things don't have to be dealt with when someone loves God, loves His law. But when you're trying to identify the beatitude man, when you're trying to identify the wheat harvest, and you're talking to Israelites who all were circumcised, who all go to synagogue, who all worship in the temple, Jesus wasn't talking to Gentiles, He was talking to Jews who all expected to end up in Abraham's bosom. He is identifying where they are not God lovers, but they are Jew lovers. They are uh, position lovers. They are loving their name among their neighbors and their friends. Chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, the fulfilling of the law and the prophets means that I will appropriately love my fellow man. Okay? Appropriately, I will love my fellow man. My fellow earthly inhabitant. Obviously, there are priorities. Uh, do good to them. To the household of faith first. Take care of, show piety at home first, the Bible says. All right? And so, yes, I'm supposed to take care of my family. I'm supposed to take care of the church. I'm supposed to take care of the Christian community. And then I'm supposed to love those outside the Christian community and try to help them and so forth. But it's all got to be within the realms of loving God. God's law, God's way, God's purpose, and God's establishment. This is the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets was God looking down on a race of fallen people. They blew it. They lost the garden. They're living on a cursed earth and they're going to die. But, if you'll live by my laws, if you'll follow my wisdom in your short stay on earth, you'll have a much better time of it. If you will order your society according to my word and my laws, your life will be so much better your society will be better. Your children will grow up and have a better life. Your grandchildren will have a better life. And this is God's love to remedy your problems based on your uh, failings. Your lack of wisdom has caused the problem. Here is my wisdom to fix it. Now, just think how different this planet would have been had mankind said thank you. Had mankind loved the lawgiver and loved his laws and obeyed them. You look back over history. Jesus came and he says, okay, I'm going to take God's law and I'm going to apply it in all these areas of life where you're messing up. And I'm going to show you that those who love God, those who love his law, they are going to do things a lot different than what you're doing them. And he's trying to draw a clear picture, just like I'm trying to do this morning, so that you will know whether you are wheat or tear. Which, which harvest you can end up in. You can end up the first time that sickle is put in, or the second time. You're going to be the grapes of wrath, or the wheat into his garner. And so Jesus tries to lay it all out. The Sermon on the Mount is nothing more than Jesus applying God's law in many different areas to show them that if you love God, if you have this attitude of the Beatitudes, you won't be doing this and you won't be doing that and you won't be divorcing your wife without a cause. You won't be swearing by heaven. You won't be doing all these things because those who love God's law and adhere to it don't do those things. You're not going to be praying on the corner of the street to be seen of men. You're not going to be judging hypocritically. 
Oh, look at the mode in your eye. Well, you got a beam in your own eye. You're, you're also not going to be giving that which is holy unto the dogs, nor casting your pearls before swine. Okay? These are all principles that those who love God will be obeying. This is the law of the prophets. And he says, 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets. He says next. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Those who love God and love His law will all go through the sifting machine and end up here. The wheat harvest. Those who don't love God and His law they will be sifted through life, but they will end up in the chaff pile. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a Catholic, a Baptist, if you're a member of Living Faith Christian Fellowship, if you're the preacher's kid, or you're the deacon's kid, or you're the bus kid. Okay? The Sermon on the Mount is meant to identify the person that God is looking for. And He ends it by saying... Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Which is the whole thing he's been talking about. Those who say, Lord, Lord. Those who give uh, a verbal assent to Judaism or God's law or the Bible or Christianity. But by the way they use the law, by the way they use the gospel, by what they do with the Bible, it shows they really don't love God they really don't love his ways. And all these, a number of these things, a mixture of these things will be showing up in their life because they are using the law for their own purposes. They're not loving the law. And they don't have the love of God in their heart. So he says here, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Thy name have cast out devils. In thy name have many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. Anomia. So this whole sermon is being summed up. It's not, it's not a matter of just hitting all kinds of different topics. There is a method. There is a motive. There is a train of thought in this sermon. By starting out with the blessed man. And then showing... How that this man would not use the law this way or that way. This man would not be found doing this or that. This man is not going to say, Lord, Lord. This man is going to fulfill the righteousness of the law because he loves the Lord. And he's also going to build on the rock. He will be the wise man which built his house on the rock by hearing and doing what Jesus said. They will not be workers of lawlessness. They will build on the rock of God's word, God's law. They will be like Jesus who said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so building on the rock has to do with following Jesus' example and teaching and building on every word of God. Not calling any of it least. Not breaking the least commandment and teaching men so, but living by every word of God. This is the law and the prophets. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. The parts of the law where God said, write it down, I will erase Amalek from the face of the earth. The law that said, this, the, the God that sent the prophet to, to Saul and said, go get rid of Amalek. The one that called the children of Israel to drive out the inhabitants of Canaan because the iniquity of the Amorite was full. The God of love who has given his law, who has set up righteous government principles. Those who love him and love every jot and tittle of his law, who love all the word of God, 
who build on all that Jesus said, they are on a narrow way that leadeth to life. They will be the wheat. But those who are on the broad road will be the chaff. And so, very profound and yet very simple. If you don't get this, your theology book is not going to do you any good. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the sermon that characterizes uh, the message of the Messiah. Is it real deep and hard to understand? No. It's very plain, and yet it's profound. Because this describes very clearly through different, different aspects of life, it describes the God-lover's and excludes those who really don't love God. Oh, they'll fight for the law. Oh, they'll fight for creation. Oh, they'll fight for all kinds of things. But they really don't love God because then they wouldn't be using His law this way. They might love religion. They might like to talk religion. They may like to look religious. They might like to preach religion. They might go out and make one, uh, go trumpet sea and land to make a proselyte but then make him twofold more the child of hell than themselves because they're actually building disciples of themselves and they really don't love God. They love their sect as opposed to the Sadducees and the Herodians and so forth. So, after 37 years, has it gotten more complex? No, it's gotten more simple. 37 years of studying the Bible to get rid of the complex stupidity that was piled upon top of it when it was handed to me, the teaching that I received, getting rid of the complex theological nonsense and getting down to the simple basic truth of Scripture. You are going to be the wheat, the bride, the, the precious fruit of the earth. Or you're going to be the chaff, the tares, that's rejected. Most theology is meant to save people from that reality. Most churches are set up to save people from that reality. To deliver them from their responsibility. To give them false comfort. To get them caught up in false piety. Oh, we talk about we hear about the self-righteous. The self-righteous were those misusing God's law. The righteous, God-loving people are not self-righteous. God declares them righteous. God says they're righteous and he will. So someday, all of you looking at me this morning, you will love the Lord. That will affect how you pray. That will affect your giving, your alms. That will affect your judging. That will affect your marriage. That will affect your swearing. That will affect everything mentioned and much more. That will affect your uh, relationship with your fellow man and your relationship with God. That will affect your view of government. That will affect your view of God's Word. If you really love God and love His Word, you will become more and more of His mind. And when you become more and more of His mind, you won't do these foolish, hypocritical things that Jesus is speaking of. No! Becoming more like God is not going to remove you from His law. Two plus two. But becoming of the mind of God is going to make you apply His law the way He would apply it. The way He would be pleased to apply it. What He intended when He told Moses to write it. Okay? God never intended for His law to be used by carnal men for carnal purposes. Never. He never intended any part of His law to be used to justify 
that which is not godly. So, you will, if you end up in the pile of wheat that's going to be put in the barn, the precious fruit of the earth, if you're going to be in that harvest, it'll be because God has been watching your life. And He knows that you love Him. You will have the attitudes of the Beatitudes growing in your life. Because that's Him. You will grow in benevolence. You will grow in true piety. You will love God and you will... And, and, and looking at His glory, you will be changed into His glory. In viewing His person, in loving His person, you will be changed into His person. Genesis to Revelation. That's what God's looking for. Simple. So simple. And the person who tries to climb up another way. The person who doesn't really love God and love His ways, His Word. If you don't love His ways, you don't love Him. You may have a God of your own making. You say, I love God. Hold it. If you don't love everything He said and did, you don't love Him. And your God's not going to save you. Your God is, is a myth that's going to be in hell with you. Okay? But if you love the God of this book, you love His words and His ways, and you seek to know them properly because you love Him. You seek to apply them properly because you love Him. You will be changed into His image. And you will be the precious fruit that God wants to harvest from this earth. It's that simple. And if you don't really love Him, you will never make it into that harvest. Because He will know. He will know. He cannot be fooled. And so... Every time you pick up the Bible and open it, you're finding indicators. You're listening to indicators that's helping you discern in your heart the love factor. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's all about the love factor. Is it there or is it not? Say, Brother Mark, it took you 37 years to figure this out. No, I, I understood a lot of this the moment I started loving God. The moment I repented and gave my heart to the Lord, I loved His Word. Now, by loving His Word and loving Him, I was delivered from the false teaching of the Baptist Church. I was delivered from the false teaching of the Mennonite church. I was delivered from the Calvinists and the Antinomians and the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and everybody else I came across. I was delivered from their heresy because I loved the Lord. Because I loved His Word. Because I loved the Jesus of this book. Because I wanted to properly understand the God of this Bible. And that love will deliver anyone who has it who exercises it, who puts it into practice, who spends time seeking the God that they claim to love. It will deliver you. So yes, I, I, the moment I gave my heart to God in full surrender, I loved Him. And I can thank God that that love for Him has led me away and helped me to uncover the simple truth and to rejoice in the simple truth and to embrace the simple truth in spite of all the garbage that's been piled upon it. Let's stand together. Profound and yet so simple. Why do we have to keep saying it over and over and over? Well, it's a great blessing to be reminded and encouraged because we are Sometimes slow, slow learners. But this is it. There's going to be two harvests. Someday, maybe soon. 
the command will go forth. Put in your sickle. Now when that sickle goes forth and doesn't harvest you, it'll be too late. Mm -hmm. Forever too late. When Jesus said, agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, he was talking about that scenario. If you are holding on to your disobedience and your bad attitude, when that sickle is put forth, suddenly you're going to be before the judge. And once you're before the judge, you can't settle out of court. You're already there. You're in court. You're going to get the judgment of the court. And he says, you'll, you'll not depart till you pay the very last farthing. In Luke, he applies this to the Pharisees and their resistance to his message. And God Almighty, in the person of the Messiah, says to the Pharisees, you better settle out of court or you're in big trouble. Brothers and sisters, don't risk being drawn to the courtroom of God unprepared. You will either be a God lover, loving God, seeking God, loving His Word, trying to please Him, or not. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't matter how fast you talk and excuse yourself. If you're not, you're not. Right. And it will be too late to change. And that's all. Of it. That's the everlasting gospel. That's it. Any thoughts? I wanted to point it out at the end of chapter 7. It says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I believe the people listening to him that day, when he got down, it's like, what are you saying? He cut to the heart. I mean, it's like, you make it so clear to us. And I would expect there was people in that audience that day that were like, you know what? That made such good sense. I always wondered why this or that bothered me. And it's because I loved right. I didn't have all the arguments why what they were practicing was wrong. But now I see it. And there was probably other people there that were like, really mad. It was like, you just, you just called us God-haters when we were parading under the disguise of defending his law and using it. But when he got done, it was like, what do you say? That's what Paul was dealing with. Don't tell me it's lawful. Is it expedient? Is it good? Is it charitable? Is it righteous? Don't don't argue lawfulness, Paul says. No, you're you're not you're the wheat. The wheat don't fall back on just arguing lawfulness. Mm -mm. The wheat live in the realm of expedience and propriety and holiness. Yeah, the wheat are going to be looking for opportunities to advance God's kingdom and prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God not trying to get the best of both worlds. Let's pray. It's not a lover of God. Would that have an effect on how they interpreted Jesus? Because if you don't love the Old Testament, do you love God? There's a problem there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You love a concept, but you don't love God if you don't love His Word. His re the revelation of Himself for the first 4,000 years of life on earth. That's the, that's the only revelation of Himself that He gave. Okay? It's the only Bible. It's the only Bible that was uh, around. So, if you don't love that God... What are the chances that you'll interpret Jesus contrary to that God and in line with your own God? Yeah, most likely you will. And so Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' life, so many things have been transmitted uh, to the next generation. They've been interpreted according to somebody's God but not the true God. Because if you if you were someone who loved the God of Genesis to Malachi, 
you would interpret Jesus with that same love, right? Because he loved that God too. He spoke for that God. It would all line up in your mind. There would be no problem in your mind. It would all seem so logical. But if you have an issue with that God from Genesis to Malachi, you'll have a really hard time seeing Jesus in that light. Subtle, isn't it? Because we know a lot of people who are nice people, good people, pious people, godly people, who sincerely love the Bible, they say, and yet we can see how subtle is the ways of the serpent to derail them off on a side road of thinking that of loving something besides Jehovah the I am so let's be careful we need to really take this serious in our own life oh okay I say oh yeah I love God if I ask you do you love God yeah I love it okay how do you know are you concerned about making sure? That's, that's what I want to bring across this morning. Because that will be the criteria. That will determine the harvest positioning for you. Is that genuine love of the God of Genesis to Revelation. The Jehovah, the I Am, the Messiah, True love there will, will find that path, that narrow path that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Why few? It's so plain. If there's an almighty creator who's looking for a harvest of a certain type of people, why is that path so hard to find? It's subtle, and self-deception is a real thing. Let's stand. Someone have a selection?